Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor, the easiest way to shop for the best tickets thanks to their revolutionary grading system. Buy and sell tickets in two taps on your phone. Everything fully guaranteed. Right now, my listeners get $10 off baseball tickets the first time they use SeatGeek. Just use promo code BSMLB. Download the SeatGeek app today or go right to SeatGeek.com. We are also brought to you by the Ringer Podcast Network, which doesn't just include this one. We have House of Carbs for food, Larry Wilmore, Cousin Sal for gambling, Ringer NFL, NBA, MLB shows, The Masked Man, The Watch, Achievement Oriented. Tate, what else did I forget? Say MLB? Yeah. We have more than that. House I can't even remember. Yeah, we, House of Carbs. I mean, geez. Wilmore. Oh, Game of Thrones Game binge, of Thrones, mode. Yeah, binge mode. Binge mode's back. They just did season seven, episode one. And speaking of uh, Game of Thrones... Talk to Thrones, our Twitter show, Sunday night. Nathan Hubbard, you used to work for Twitter. I did. Once upon a time. Uh, our Twitter show, right after Game of Thrones ends on HBO, go to twitter.com. You can follow our post-game show that starts immediately after Game of Thrones, at Ringer, or use the hashtag Talk to Thrones. Chris Ryan, Andy Greenwald, Miley Rubin, Jason Concepcion, banging out Game of Thrones knowledge. Do you watch Game of Thrones, Nathan? I do, but I am. You're like excited. level one, like me. I am. You just watch it, but you don't know what's going on. I'm exactly. I'm more excited about House of Carbs in this moment. Yeah. I'm coming for House. Nathan was our backup choice for House of Carbs. If House's contract didn't come through, Nathan was <laughs> going to take it over. It's been a very food competitive relationship. Uh, coming up, Nathan Hubbard. But first, the Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, Pearl Jam. Bring it. All right, my friend Nathan Hubbard is here. I think you've been on the podcast before, right? Yes, we have. A couple potted. years ago. We potted long and hard about ticketing and... On Grantland. We did. Yeah, you were working for Live Nation at the time. I was. Since then, you went to Twitter. I was CEO of Ticketmaster. We had a good one. Yeah. Um, I want to... We. This is weird because um, we're actually pretty good friends and we've had all these conversations already, but we have to figure out how to do it on the podcast <laughs> like we've never had them. We'll I do our best... S- Let's start. I want to start with music. And uh, you wrote a column for The Ringer a little while back about old cello and nostalgia rock, which has now become 50% of the highest grossing concerts that we have. Dodger Stadium last week had Fleetwood Mac without Christine McVie. With no Christine McVie. They had the Eagles with no Glenn Fry because he tragically passed away. With Deacon Fry. They had Journey with no Steve with Perry. With no Steve Perry's in a cave somewhere. So this was like not even just... Doobie Brothers with Michael McDonald. Like Was Michael McDonald there? <laughs> no. Oh. He's at home. Like, <laughs> Nobody Why are you doing call this? me for the gig. <laughs> like he's not there. So it was basically all of our favorite bands from the 70s, but without crucial people. But, but they're not bands. They are ideas of bands. Right. right. Name only bands, but yet sold out. Right. Dodger Stadium. Hard to get tickets. And and, and the thing is, like, this is happening elsewhere, too. Right. A huge seller this summer. Grateful Dead featuring (laughs) otherwise douchebag John Mayer absolutely filleting Jerry Garcia's parts on guitar. John Mayer has put the entire Grateful Dead fan base on his back and like moved that band and its community and everything that it's about into this generation. So it's happening I'm it, pro John Mayer. I'm, I don't I, care. I, I don't care if it's unpopular. I, 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 I go very far. I think he's with talented. Him. I think he's funny. I he think is. he made some interview mistakes that spooked him. Uh, I think he had some celebrity relationships he shouldn't have had. And now he's kind of uh, coming out of the ashes. My, my band made uh, an album literally right after he finished Room for Squares. Yeah. And so we got to hear the tapes of his AOL chat sex with like North Carolina co-eds. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day before he figured out. Not to do that not anymore. Not to do that anymore. Yeah. See, he made a lot of mistakes and, early on. And now I think that he is, I think he's one of the best guitar players we have. And I think he's like ironically best when he's not playing his own music. Yeah. If you, if you go watch his Jay-Z his performance with Jay Z post nine eleven, Jay Z's nine eleven tribute concert, he absolutely slays it, and he's slaying it with the dead too. But the point is, these are zombie bands, yeah. And like for me, the question is, like, why is this happening? It is not natural 
for people to just come out and blatantly accept this like nothing happened right like i i like you are a parent you did you ever go to the wiggles like the like four ambiguous awesomely ambiguously gay australian I, guys <laughs> who like wear different color shirts and they sing kids songs i took my kids to the wiggles yeah like it turned out Jeff had gotten sick and left. One of the guys, Jeff, got sick and left the band. Jeff Wiggle. Jeff Wiggle. And like, so they replaced him with Greg. Greg Wiggle. And I take the kids to see them live. And within five minutes, my kids are looking at me like, where the fuck is Jeff? Right? Yeah. So that's the natural and human like, reaction. Jeff? Right. No, that's the natural human reaction to wheeling out a band with a non original member. But now all these old white people are gathering in fields to see like tribute bands basically right and i don't understand it you and i have argued about you two like you two pastor again you two one of my favorite bands ever but i went to see them at staples maybe 10 years ago yes and i'm like i'm out we I'm don't out. this makes me sad i saw you two at their complete apex at the boston garden in st patrick's day 1991 and now I'm here at Staples, and this is like going to see Larry Bird and Magic Johnson playing in the big three. I, I can't do it. The beauty of Periscope and Facebook Live is that on any given night, you can watch these bands at any different point around the world. So like a great bedtime thing for me during the week is I go in and search up my favorite bands that's on tour and watch them play. The U2 stuff, I saw them live, but this tour, they were absolutely killing it. And we should not talk about this. We're going to fight the whole time. Here's what I, th I, I think people want to hear fighting. Well, okay, let's but, get criticized for I agree too much with my guests. So let's let's go okay, at it. Look, they're still killing it. They are still killing it. They are not songwriters. Are they killing it as an actual great band or as the band they used to be? It's amazing. Like Billy Joel kills it at MSG, but yes. he's not as good as he was 40 years ago. N not in the slightest. But so let's. Why is this, this phenomenon happening? Right. It's because there are a bunch of old people with tons of money. Yeah who are not cool anymore, who need to feel cool in some, it's like plastic surgery for their egos. They've got to like relive the past. So but they, what's cool about hanging out with a bunch of old people who aren't cool? I That's when you I, look around, you're like, oh my God, I'm these people. I think that they just, the music itself allows them to live in some fantasy that says they still are back in those places, right? The question that I have is why are these old musicians doing this right well, like for, why for cash like they well there's no other reason because right because up until 2000 if you were a giant rock star you could go sit in your castle and just hang out and collect the collect them checks right and well the rolling stones didn't do that and, and well but they could have potentially yeah the, the difference is that now you know back then they made 90 percent of their money from albums and 10 percent from the road and today it's completely flipped thanks to Napster right. and ticket prices have gone up. And so they got these castles, but they can't pay the mortgage because they're not making albums that matter anymore. So they got to get out on the road and they got to play. And w what you would think that would lead to is a bunch of old guys just mailing it in. But to bring it full circle, I think these tribute bands where, you know, Glenn Fry's son is playing or you know, uh, Eddie's son Wolfgang's playing bass in Van Halen or John Mayer with the Dead, whatever it is, it's injecting a little bit of life and something new into the band so that they actually bring it every night. Look, I would have thought that the classic probably wasn't going to be great because it is a bunch of zombie bands. But the, 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 the report coming out of Dodger Stadium was there was great energy. You know, Vince Gill was there. Bob Seger was there. And it mattered. Vince Gill? <clears throat> yeah, Vince Gill's like everybody's. It, these things are turning into like the Grammy All Star Jam at this point, right? Which which is always awful. Which well is fine, but uh, uh, but that that is, I I can't get, I I don't have any other explanation for why at the high at the high end of the old people people are still coming out and standing in these fields and participating, other than they need something to hold on to. They're living longer. They're spryer. They just want to be cool. I would yeah, I'd throw two more things in there: disposable income. Yeah, they're super rich. And it's a fun place to go smoke some pot with 60,000 other people. So that's a great point. Look, the only the live business is killing it, right? Because you've got you've got these massive acts that are old and people are spending a bunch of money on that. And then at the low end, meaning like the the younger end, millennials who are otherwise just staring at their phones all day having experiences with these screens, like they need to connect with people, right? There's some visceral chemical thing that happens when people come together in crowds. And so they're, it's true that they're favoring experiences over things. And so at, at that end, you've got the business absolutely, you know, absolutely blowing up. And so the question is like, what can get in the way? 
And there's two things. The first is somebody walks in and sets off a bomb. Yeah. And the other is Jeff Sessions. And what I mean by that is, like, if you're Jeff Sessions right now, if I put on my evil Jeff Sessions hat and I go, hmm, let me it's, think it's about... It's just called a Jeff Sessions hat. Right. If I okay. put on my Jeff Sessions hat, like, and I want to um, reignite the war on drugs, and I also want to go at a bunch of Democratic voters, yeah. and I want to go at a bunch of Democratic campaign c- contributors. Like, I believe, I, you know, artists are drugs now... Drugs at concerts? Drugs at concerts. Yeah. Yeah. Like, go get, like, you could just, you know, bring in a, a bus, 10 buses, and just start trucking people out of there. At the same time, you go after the artists who are probably the largest single source of contribution to, like, democratic politics. So, But here's another interesting wrinkle to this. Don't do it, Jeff. Don't do it, Jeff. Um, Fire him. Fire him, Trump. So it's made me reevaluate the whole meaning of what a concert experience is. Because I used to think it was to go see music that you could only hear on an album. You're making a face. I'm listening. But I think in the last 10 years, it became so easy to see your bands, your favorite people, your favorite singers, whatever, because of YouTube and these different channels that run the concerts. A little bit of the mystique is gone, right? Like when you when I was in college and a band came to either the Worcester Centrum you're still making a face or Boston garden. This is my one chance to see them in a way that wasn't just listening to yes. the cassette. You could have gone an entire life and three album cycles uh, and never having seen a visual representation of the artist. Other I have than the no album connection cover. to the band yes. other than the times I listen okay. to them I'm in my you. dorm room. I'm with you. And now with, uh, it's just, you can go, let's say you're a YouTube fan. Yeah. You love you too. You can go on YouTube and there's, I mean YouTube, and there's five thousand YouTube but it's just YouTube not the concerts. Same as being there, right? But that's what I mean. So what's still bringing people there is the experience of experiencing the band with other people. But then I also think the mobile part of it, where it's like in the old days, it's like maybe you took a photo of I'm at this concert, you, your arms around three of your buddies, and the band's behind you. Now it's like. Not only am I at that concert, here's here's me holding up my iPhone and here's their performance of blank. Yes. And that's become its own self-sustaining thing. It, it, it has. Look, I was at Twitter when we were getting ready to launch Periscope and we'd bought it and, and we're getting ready to launch it. And it was so obvious that well, the, you left out the part where you destroyed the poor people who took off at South by for two weeks and then Twitter <laughs> well, just annihilated I, I, I them. I what was it? What were they called? Uh, uh, Meerkat. Poor Meerkat. Yeah. I mean, the Rise and Fall of Meerkat is, is a great two-week documentary. It's like Friendster or MySpace. Like, <laughs> if you don't build a moat around your business, that's your problem. Like, so, so you saw it coming, and like, what was so... The obvious application for this was live, right? And you could tell that as soon as it went... As soon as you went live, there was going to be the people who said, no, you can't, you can't let these things into concerts. You can't broadcast it. Yeah, this is going to ruin concerts. It's, ru- it's bad for the band. And, and I sent like a bunch of tweets just being like, artists, ignore the old dudes in your camp who tell you that. This is going to be the best advertisement for your show ever. And yeah. it is. And I think that stuff has contributed. So you think it's driven it more dri- people to the It is getting people there because there just is something, there, there's some chemical uh, uh, reaction in our bodies when we are close to other human beings and so many of our experiences today are staring at that phone like refreshing our Twitter feed with 9-11 PSD over and over again and we have to get out just like t- from our survival instincts get us out to mingle with other people and and, and so listen it's a good time I mean, to be in speaking live speaking of the phone it's more fun to go to a concert now because let's face it concerts have some boring stretches and now you have your phone as your buddy. You'd be like, ah, I hate this song. Ah, I'm going to look at I'm gonna look at my emails. <laughs> or I'm going to try to f- take the perfect picture well, or whatever. And you can kill four, se- four minutes. Well, and there was that weird, like, awkward teen phase of the business where, like, wireless networks couldn't hold a crowd in a stadium. Like, the, your phone just couldn't function. You mean and, like like a week ago? Right. But, <laughs> but, but what stadiums are holding Wi-Fi? But, but we're there in a better place now where yeah. content that gets created can actually come out of a venue. It's not True. like the lid isn't on it. So in real time, you can go in and see what's happening. And and I think I think it's just like they're walking advertisements for Do the Do you know events. what the, the first great concert YouTube moment was? Uh, it's one we've dissected endlessly. Uh, wait, tell me. No. Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham, Silver Spring, oh. whatever concert that was. Yeah, where, where she's just, she she's, just on him. she's just screaming at him. Yeah. She was mad about 
she was mad about the fact that never it got cut off away, rumors. Never yeah, get she away. dumped. Yeah. He dumped her. He got married. He's happy. Yeah. and she just turns it on him, and that became this and viral YouTube it. moment yeah. that actually put the band in a different light. I, I, it was a really I, fascinating moment for them. I, I love that moment. It, her voice still was hanging on. What about that look on her face, that one close-up? Yeah. It's the all-time scariest, yeah. you broke my heart, and I'll never forgive you look that anyone's ever actually had captured on video on stage in front of 20,000 people. Somebody needs to create a meme with that face juxtaposed to the like sweetness of that uh, blame it on my wild heart backstage YouTube thing. <laughs> oh, my God. Where she is just like angelic. The greatest moment in cocaine history. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Probably. She, she, I'm guessing. I, I think there might be others, but we'll go with that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would it's urge anybody who's Stevie. listening to this, just pause the podcast, go on YouTube and Google Stevie Nicks Wild Heart. She's backstage with like her hair hair yes. lady or makeup yes, no, lady? Her hair lady is just messing with her and she is listening to a demo. They're playing in the background. They're playing a Stevie Nicks song, which Stevie Nicks, who's so but amped up, just she, decides to start She performing. just can't get enough of she it. She can't. She's performing her own song with this random and, hair person and it's it's one of the most arousing moments of the early it, 80s. It is it's, the sexiest thing on film. Yeah, I mean, Stevie Nicks, it's hard to hard to believe after all these years, but it was the goddess of the late... 70s then somehow you watched I that Iovine documentary and he yeah. dated her yeah for a year somehow I don't think there's backstage footage of uh of Britney doing that or no <laughs> that was that was the end of like the real authentic like anyway I love that clip 40 40 years since rumors the yeah. most successful non-greatest hits album of all time and that's why Fle like Fleetwood Mac on stage that's how they get to keep going on stage exactly but but <clears throat> it's not Fleetwood Mac like I'm sorry but Christy McVie wrote you can't Songbird that is I will bring the dragons to fight you if you tell me that's not a top 10 love song of all time it is an unbelievable song she is a sneaky she may not be the heart of that band but she is a very important organ we, it's almost like having the 96 Bulls reunion and they're like Dennis Rodman can't be here but Instead, we got uh, Stacey King's going to be here instead. Look, at a macro level, that classic is basically evidence that Irving Azoff can get anybody to do anything. And because he's got a bunch of bands that otherwise probably wouldn't be together, somehow he convinced Henley to go do this. And, you know, it's like, it's like Henley always said, like, Irving Azoff might be the devil, but he's, he's our devil. And Irving's just smarter than everybody else and understands how to create, you know, that environment where fans come. How are arenas and stadiums making the concert experiences better? Like the Forum in LA is probably the single best artist-friendly acoustic place you can see a concert, but are the stadiums getting better? The, the stadiums are not getting better and, and arguably they're getting worse without, without pointing fingers. I mean, I think that, I mean, you, you know, uh, for all the ball busting you do of Dolan, like he and Irving are taking a look at markets where you have these big cavernous arenas yeah. That aren't made for artists. Yeah. And, you know, Jim cares, Jim Dolan cares a lot about sound and the artist experience. And so they're not just in, in LA now, you know, but they're, they're trying to build these buildings that are sanctuaries for artists and for music. And I'm pro James Dolan as a music guy, not, not his music, but just <laughs> like the forum, I think is, was really smart and awesome and a great idea. He gets credit for that. He does. If and, he owned and the he Knicks as well as he knew music, he would be a great NBA uh, owner. I understand. He and Irving had the vision for that and, and they're going to roll it out to other places. I think that that's just the issue. The, the good news for a stadium goer is that they're spending a ton of money now on, on the set. I mean, talking about you too. I mean, they should, there should be some Grammy equivalent for, like set design on a stage because it's not really just a music show anymore. It's a visual experience. They've been doing that for tw for 20 years. They, that's been their all time special. Every time they get in a room yeah. and they say, what are we going to do? And they get with Arthur Fogel, who's probably the greatest promoter of, of this generation. And they figure it out. Um, quick break to talk about Quicken Loans. Our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, they understand that home plays a big role in your life and family. That's why they create a Rocket Mortgage, which gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. How's your home loan? Is it okay? I'm doing okay. Okay, good. I need uh, one. Well, whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, with Rocket Mortgage, you get a transparent online process. It gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. Tate, you're like three years away, too. From what? A house? Yeah. Rocket Mortgage. Maybe, maybe Quicken Loans will help you. Uh, 
Get a more real mortgage approval in minutes, adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to make sure you're getting the right solution for you. That's Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash Bill Simmons. That's my name. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumer access, dot org, number 3030. Who are your season ticket bands? My season ticket bands? Yeah. What is that? So like if you get season tickets for an NBA team, yeah. you get to go to all the games. Who are the bands out there for you that it's like they're touring, just sign me up, here's my credit card? Uh, How did, many are there? Uh, oh, God. Any, I mean, Prince was number one on my list. He's and, dead. And, he can't count anymore. I, oh. It sounds like U2's on your list. U, U2's on my list. I mean, Coldplay's on my list. Jay-Z is on my list. Jay-Z, when was the last time he toured? He's coming out right now. With uh, he's coming out this fall in a bunch of arenas w- with the 444 tour. So that sounds like an I might get divorced soon. I need some extra cash tour. That's what they should call it. <laughs> no. The Jay Z I might get divorced soon. I need more cash tour. <laughs> I think he maybe he maybe has already gotten some of the cash for that, and and, mm. and he's going to go out and fulfill it. But but uh, hey, hit it while it's hot, and he is as hot as it as as it comes right now. So uh, who no younger of, bands? I mean, right now. Uh, who is You're lukewarm on hip hop and concert. I mean, look, I, I just I don't know who is the young band who's absolutely filleting it right now. Kanye, for sure. If he ever does it again, Kanye is more likely to have a fashion show. His but, new his new jackets that he designed. I, but but Kanye, if it make happened, a fucking album. Yeah, I, I would I would go see Radiohead uh, mm. pretty much anywhere in any place. Okay. Um, and I just don't know that I sign up for, because here's the problem. There aren't that many bands right now. What about Deacon Fry's new solo album? <laughs> that are doing a different show every night. Yeah. And that's what's sort of, you know, getting lost along the way is it's kind of now becoming karaoke and less about a, a night in, night out. Like you can go see Pearl Jam. Absolutely. If they if they tour it again, absolutely. I just didn't want us to list off a bunch of '90s bands that you and I both, if we were answering well, honestly, would would say, yeah, Pearl Jam. I would go see every well, single show. There's the no bands anymore. You were the one that emailed me the thing. I what know. was it last week about hip hop has officially become more popular than rock? Yeah. Which I would have guessed had already happened. Yeah. But I think rock. You even look back at uh, the last. I wouldn't call it glory years, but that last stretch, starting with basically the Strokes. Killers, Kings of Leon, like that last kind of vestige. Yeah. There's no bands like even like that anymore. And well, it's not like those bands were like amazingly successful. No, I mean, I think what started to happen in even in the 90s. And by the way, I do want to add one artist to your list of people who, if they died in the 90s, would have been bigger than they are today. And that's Adam Duritz. But uh, in Kevin oh, Gross. So you're talking about the pod. I did Chris, Chris Ryan and Andy Greenwald on The Watch. Yes. I said Dave Matthews Band, yes. who we're going to talk about later. Okay. Uh, R.E.M. and Billy Corgan, if they had all died at a specific apex during their career, they'd be much bigger now than they were. It's the old Chuck Klosterman theory. So who did you add to that? Count of Crows. I think Adam Duritz. That band After was, the second album? Yes, and he's dating like Jennifer Aniston and Courtney. Co- like he's just, he's got a murder's row of Hollywood actresses. He had, they had a fat. great run. He, one of his problems, other than that uh, he dated too many hot women, I think people resented him for it, was their concerts he would never sing the songs like they he like they were in the a, album yeah like he was a spoken word poet or something yeah he was like i'm gonna change the and people couldn't sing along with it they would get mad yes the kind of gross fans would leave the concerts if, upset if, if he just went out and didn't and it, actually if he'd mailed it in it would have been better because yeah, be, yeah I don't just know. be a karaoke machine anyway if, if he died early i think he would be much bigger than he is today that's a good one um super bowl halftime shows so I got this email from somebody that... Uh, do we know who's going to do it this year? This is from Dave, David Steffen. He, he ran back my, a 2010 mailbag that I did where I guessed the next 10 Super Bowl halftime shows. 2011, Beyonce and Jay-Z. 2012, Springsteen and John Cougar Mellencamp. <laughs> Cougar's nowhere to be found. 2013, Ayla Brown, the daughter of our new president, former Cosmo model Scott Brown. I barely even remember that joke. <laughs> 2014, U2 and Pearl Jam. 15, Britney Spears, Woods. I think the joke was that she married Tiger Woods. There you go. 16, this Snoop Dogg. This held up Dog. very well. 
16, Snoop Dogg, Jay-Z, and Kanye West, parentheses, just released from jail. 2017, Timberlake and Ayla Brown. 18, John Mayer and Taylor Swift Woods. <laughs> 2018, Coldplay. And 2020, the Dave Matthews Band with special guest Carrie Underwood Woods. So he points out some of these were dead on and some of these were completely, totally wrong. Yeah. All right, now look at forward Super Bowl halftimes. Next 10 years, let's, let's bang out 2021 to 2030. You figure Adele's in one. Coldplay? Adele, no, Coldplay has run their their time there because they they did it. You know, sort people of, don't like English people. Well, it's, but the, remember, Beyonce stole the show with the formation. So Beyonce's thing. back. She's she's next decade at least once. Taylor Swift is going to play the Super Bowl. Swift. All right, we got three. I gotta believe that Justin Timberlake, if he can JT, squeeze out right, one four. more album, is going to do it. Okay, Kanye. I think Kanye West should play the Super Bowl. Kanye comeback? There's five. I think a Korean pop. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Some YouTube star. Logan Paul, 2026. Uh, it, you know, we're missing um, like a Dierks Bentley or a Kenny Chesney or like a giant oh, middle America country. Eric Church. Stra- Eric, Eric Church. Eric Church, this tape from Carolina. Like straight up, you know, Chris Stapleton comes in and does one song and fillets it. I, there's going to be that, that moment. 2028, the Rolling Stones. <laughs> right. right with all their kids not actually the rolling stones but isn't it amazing though that these big ass the idea like the rock the band's basically gone is my point yes it's like even you could talk about any any band that came in in the 2000s is not big enough to play the super bowl except for maybe coldplay so the, so the last big one to do it will have been like the who right like the Killers, I don't think are big enough. To no way. Their twenty year anniversary of but, whatever that album look, was. Look, I would have told you that I didn't think Bruno Mars was could really carry the Bruno show. Bruno Mars is somebody for and, next and, decade, and, and he's done it. He's now appeared twice, and our dude Sean Mendes might be in the man. mix. Oh, I love Sean Mendes. We have so much Sean Mendes stock. <laughs> I, I went in big. In. I bought Sean Mendes and Netflix. Well, I'm worried. I'm one yeah. for two. <laughs> yeah, stay away from Snapchat. That's the trifecta of death. The, <laughs> no, but, Netflix went up. Uh, I know. I still think you'll average out down if you go if you go with those. But I'm waiting for the Mendes burnout. I love the kid. Oh no. I, I think he's. I think he's going to be one of the few who makes it. But. Listen, you either be, you either go the way of, of Bieber or you go the way of Taylor, and let's see what happens. Bieber's a candidate for next year. Bieber, Bieber could absolutely play it. You think Taylor Swift and Adele and Beyonce are the three most important people in music right now, correct? I, I do. I do. I don't really understand what DJ Khaled is doing or why he's able to assemble these these hit songs with like lots of artists on them. And, and I almost wonder if it's not going to be a single artist based Super Bowl show going forward, that they're just going to be these like Grammy celebrity jams. Or like three or four celebs. Just yeah. Like Despacito. Like these are the songs that are being created where you know, people are featured on other people's. And so I, I it almost feels like we're going to move to just the celebrity all-star cast in a way from putting the pressure on a single artist to carry the whole venue. They're already sort of transitioning us in that way. The Coldplay Beyonce thing was a good example of that. Like nobody's going solo at this point. Let's talk about the, how three female artists are ruling the world right now. Well, they are. I mean, the, the, the scary thing for me with Adele is just that something's not right. She's not built for touring. Yeah. It seems like her voice burns out every time. She's not. And, and, you know, I wrote a piece in 2015 on her when she sort of broke those sales records. Yeah. And at that moment in time, you know, she was she was the biggest artist in the world. And I think today you're right. I think it's Beyonce. Rightly so. I think she's the queen. And you just know, like Taylor Swift is the the training montage is doing the Rocky training montage right now somewhere in the woods in Nashville, building up writing a record and and she's going to come in and bring uh bring sort of her next punch and so between the three of them you know for me it is that you think she's in russia yeah she's like doing slide? sit-ups with giant beard? <laughs> with yeah that's why she's leaving her apartment in a box because she's <laughs> jacked now do we believe that story i tate do you believe that story i saw a photo it looked it looked legit I, I it just, seemed like a pretty big box. <laughs> like if you were going to bring out Taylor Swift in a box, you'd pick that box. More than that, though, I wouldn't put it past her to be smart enough 
to start a conversation about her leaving her apartment in a box. Well, she if she is, was going to do that, then she would have had over the years a lot of kind of dubious, maybe possibly fake celebrity relationships. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. She's had like eight. I have to change the subject on this. We have jam, on Jam Session, one of our podcasts with Amanda Dobbins and Juliet Lippman on Channel 33. They are the number one Taylor possibly fake relationship watchers. And they break down when she dated Tom Hiddleston. Is that his name? Yeah. They broke that down like it was a Zapruder film. Well, l- let me talk about Taylor the businesswoman. Yeah, you love Taylor Swift. I do. I mean, look, I, 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 my, she is, to me, um, probably the most... Look, she is emblematic of what an artist today has to be, as is Beyonce, uh, and I think Adele to a little bit of a lesser extent. But, but those are two artists who are also entrepreneurs. They understand... They, their brand and they are managing their brand out front by the way Madonna was amazing at this Madonna Bono is amazing it. at this uh, Sean Carter manages the Jay-Z brand very very well right and and but more than that they are starting to take action to shape how the industry works and whether it was Taylor's Taylor's Apple encounter where she sort of stood up on behalf of artists whether it is um, you know Beyonce's political statement uh, I, I think that uh, these are these are the most powerful artists in the world, and they have a purpose and they have a cause, and I'm super anxious to see how they move the industry forward. I think Kendrick's music and the words and the things he's singing about, I don't I don't think it has the uh, scope of the, those three, but I would I would put him in the conversation I, just in terms of where the country's going and the things that um, people are upset about and worried about. Yeah. I think he has the best chance to write. Cause that's another thing you and I have talked about is, you know, you look at the seventies and Watergate and the Vietnam war and all this stuff and the music that came out from like 68 yes. to 75 that kind of captured all the stuff people were worried about. Where's the music now? The best thing that can come out of this political environment, I think is just an explosion in creativity and I'm with but you. That's like, coming from hip hop. I think not I, rock. this I, time. I, I agree completely. Uh, and it's not coming from DJ Khaled, but <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but or you, Pitbull. yeah, it, but we were talking about the most powerful artists. I think that's different than the most important. I think Beyonce, by the way, transcends both. Yeah. Um, and I'm with you on, on Kendrick, but, but, uh, that's why I'm excited for the next couple of years. Cause you know, Trump was elected a few months ago. So it's just now we're going to start to see the cascading effect of, of this on the you know sort of young artist who's out there who's writing that, and that it could be there could be Chance, it could today. be Tyler, could be somebody you don't all know. these younger dudes. Who knows? Yep, probably reason, not Migos. Reason probably not. But, probably not. But reason yeah, for I mean that, that's the most interesting music is now coming out of that generation. Hundred percent. And it's weird that rock is just. Is it possible that we've just run out of ways to? to do rock songs? Yes. I mean, th- that's the you, point. You pointed that out to me four years ago and I got really concerned that almost every riff has been created at this point. The, every version of one, four, five guitar, chord, bass, yes. drums. One, four, five car- chord structures are done. Fender and electric guitars are not selling anywhere near as much as they were. Those are on the decline. Like, that genre is over. And that's okay. Like, jazz was here. It was great. Uh, you know, we had flappers and yeah. and and great dancing, and then we moved on. Like nobody's writing symphonies really anymore. So, do you think um, yacht rock can come back at I, least? I, <laughs> I hope so. Michael McDonald is sitting at home waiting for the call. He's ready. We drove uh, to a different part of uh, the Los Angeles area to do the Jimmy Butler podcast. Me, Tate, and Tommy. Yeah, Tate and Tommy are in their twenties, yeah. and I had I was cranking the yacht rock on the way back. Dude. I think they were confused and 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 scared. I bought my first house in L.A. from Christopher Cross. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, it, I basically bought it because it was Christopher Cross's house. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Cross had a great run. Well, until, until the advent of, of film and video uh, intersected with music, Christopher Cross was great. But I get so mad when at you Yacht like, Rock when yeah. they don't play actual Yacht Rock songs, but they play 70s love songs. Like, bread is not Yacht Rock. No. But, so I'm, I'm going to actually program Yacht Rock for a day. I've been talking to them about it. Christopher Cross's problem was that he looked like Grimace from McDonald's. And when yeah, he's he, on stage, you just he, couldn't, you couldn't have a fantasy about Christopher Cross. He didn't look great. So that was it. Um, you, you managed the Dave Matthews band way back when. I, I was the chief of staff 
to the manager of the Dave Matthews Band. Right. You're the chief of staff. His name is Corin Capshaw, who's yeah, yeah. a brilliant manager. But yes, that's how you got into the music business. Yeah. Well, I had I had been I was an artist and touring performer and made five albums uh, with the producer uh, of the Dave Matthews Band. We were managed by the Dave Matthews Band guys. So that's how I got in through that through other organization. So Dave Matthews, it's been 22 years. Like he really. The big, the big apex year for him was, I think, 95, when people yeah. were making mixtapes and putting crash on them for whoever they were trying to have sex with. And it was like, I want to have sex with you. Here's a mixtape that ends with crash. Yeah. That's how, that's how we did it. That's how we rolled back in 95 before the Tinder era. Well, well I, look, I, you, you know, just alluding to the podcast you did with Ryan, REM was the first great college band but in the 90s Dave Matthews band was the college band they yeah. played every frat in the southeast and all the backwards white hats dudes they were the 90s college band to super famous success story but but the the manager of the Dave Matthews band is the key there because he was a student of the Grateful Dead and he saw what that band remember back then Again, 90% of your money coming from albums, 10% from touring. So artists would go out once every three or four years on a tour cycle. Touring yeah. was not something you did in perpetuity or every year, except for one band, and that was the Grateful Dead. And so Corin Capshaw, who's the manager of Dave Matthews' band, saw that, saw that you could build a community that would just keep coming out if you played a show that was different every night. And that's what Dave Matthews' band became. So, so... It, it, again, in 92, people are going around and, and touring once every four years. Dave Matthews Band would go out every single summer. In the 90s, the band that sold the most tickets, more than U2, more than any other band, was Dave Matthews Band. Wow. Because Pearl Jam tried to do a modified version of that too, right? They, they, they were out there a lot. They would mix the shows up every night and stuff like that. They, but not, not to the level that Dave Matthews did. They did, but then, but then the Dave Matthews Band took it, took it a, a step further because they saw the business that was the Grateful Dead and how they built a business around touring while every other band was building a business around albums. The Dave Matthews Band sold millions and millions and millions of dollars a year in merchandise to their fans. They had it all in this giant e-commerce operation in Charlottesville, Virginia. And remember, this is in the 90s, just as sort of online commerce is getting going. Yeah. And they were smart enough to basically build the Amazon Web Services for the music industry, which is to say that every other band in the 90s and 2000s that was starting to think about how to sell stuff online directly to their fans started using the Dave Matthews Band's company to do this. So there's this giant warehouse in Charlottesville, Virginia that had signed Prince guitars and Madonna like frame posters and lithium stuff. And they used their infrastructure to help all other bands build up this direct-to-fan e-commerce connection and make a bunch a bunch of money all outside of the scope of the record label yeah and and that sort of again artist as entrepreneur spirit is it sort of really w w is what drove where the modern music business is today where it's all based around your tour and at this point you know is there an album anymore i don't know it looks to me like drake's dropping tracks every now and then and and sort of it doesn't matter if you it's have so it. weird for people like us right the it's, concept of just albums not really being a thing it's anymore. massively disorienting but that band really was the pioneer in showing how to build a business that was 365 days a year that never goes off cycle yeah and that creates an income stream for the artist now the interesting thing about Dave Matthews, because your your argument is if he died, he would have been a hero because, yes, Remember Two Things was a big record and and uh, Under the Table and Dreaming was a big record. You might make the argument, and, and Ivan did this just recently as, as he talked about artists, that the Dave Matthews band didn't take enough time to write. Yeah. Because I think from there... There hasn't been that iconic song. I mean, even that was a good lesson from the Ivy and Doc. Yes, go put yourself go, in some weird mansion for four months and just write music. Away, Pearl Jam, lock yourself in the studio north of San Francisco and just make. The you record. saw the U two Doc, right? Yes. from the late eighties. That's the most underrated music Doc. Well, it, it is, and, and they and, almost broke up, and, and they, they took went to the Germany, break, yeah. and they did. And I think once you get on that treadmill. And today's artists in particular, they've got huge infrastructures. They got 
hundreds of people who work for them and rely on them. That was the saddest part when Jerry Garcia died is the Grateful Dead actually had to think about laying off people, which right. was totally antithetical to the spirit of harmony and community and everything. Anyway, they build up these big businesses and you get on the treadmill and suddenly you're working for 200 it's almost like the athlete and their entre, you know and their entourage like they're making money for so many people in their life they don't get that break and so it's so important creatively to see people take breaks and maybe i don't know maybe that's why you know in in, in the hip hop world where where those artists today at least aren't going out as much yeah they're not spending as much time on the road maybe that affords a little bit more of a creative a creative license. We left out social as a, as one of the reasons why concerts are still thriving. The ability of bands to or singers or whoever to connect with their fans on Twitter, to push tour dates, to push merchandise on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, Snapchat, whatever they're using. It's a game changer. Over half of the t- of the of the top 100 most followed people on Twitter are musicians. Is that true? Yep. And so uh, there it is. That's the answer, right? It, it is now and soccer players look, and NBA historically, players. these artists have been disconnected from their fan base. The label was in the way. The physical record store was in the way. You know, you had all these middlemen between the artists and the fan, which to your point is why when we were kids, like we didn't even see the faces of these artists until we got on tour. But today they have these direct to consumer distribution channels. And so when we talk about the power and importance of artists like Taylor, artists like Beyonce, artists like Adele, who can at this point pretty much call their own shots. Yeah. They do not need a record company. They probably don't need a tour promoter. They got enough money. Chance doesn't have a record company. They can go raise money from anywhere they want. They yeah. have distribution channels, both through you know existing th- through their own properties, through social and so forth. They can be entrepreneurs. The question is just, um, who's going to help them get there? And, and the ones who are going to succeed are those artists who double as entrepreneurs. And, and that's Taylor. That's Beyonce. That's obviously Jay-Z at this point and, and others. That's not Britney. <laughs> Speaking of the Internet. Convenient, easy, reliable, flexible. Those are my favorite words to describe stamps.com. You don't go to the post office, right? Never. Why would you? I'd go stamps.com. Just buy and print official U.S. postage with your own computer and printer. Sign up with Stamps.com, the U.S. Postal Service, right at your fingertips. Any letter, any package, any class of mail, you're in control of all of it. They will even send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage and helps you decide the best class of mail. Your undisclosed L.A. neighborhood has, has one post office. It's always packed, right? Yes. Why would you want to be in that line? Never. Unless it was to look at... Get a passport. At, well, I get a passport? <laughs> <laughs> right now... <laughs> Use my code BS for this special offer. A four-week trial, plus postage, plus a digital scale without long-term commitments. One of the great moments of my life was when I convinced my wife to start using stamps.com so she wouldn't, because I thought she was going to kill somebody in the post office. I just figured that's where it would go down, where she would kill somebody with her bare hands. (laughs) Now she has stamps.com. Click on the microphone at the top of the homepage. Type in BS. That's stamps.com. Enter BS. Sign up today. Stamps.com. Four-week trial. Postage. A digital scale. No long-term commitments. Never go to the post office again. All right. Uh, stadium safety. Yeah. You wrote about this for The Ringer. I think we should keep talking about it. Uh, since we since you wrote that piece, yep. we had the incident in Paris. Yep. Um, Manchester. Manchester. Things we have not Turkey. had. Yeah, we have not had the massive either football stadium or soccer stadium during a game thing. We have this Ram stadium that's going up or it's right next to the airport like it feels like this should be more of a concern not to mention the part where you've always talked about a digital footprint for tickets being able to track who gets the tickets you've been writing about this for two years doesn't seem like we're any closer yet what's going on there well look in in practice just intuitively if we need to know everything about 100 people getting on an airplane Seems like we ought to know something about a hundred thousand people coming into a stadium. I would. I, it's common sense. And you know, the lunatic in Manchester blew himself up and he killed twenty-two people. He's trying to get inside and kill twenty-two hundred. So, I will tell you that behind the scenes, both at the league level and certainly in the live event business, this is concern. You know, this is one of the top concerns that there is, and and security has begun to be beefed up and. You know, I, I talked to a to a, a big concert promoter the other day, 
who said, we always just assumed, you know, security is as people come up and then they get in and then we take everything down and we never thought about the end of the show. Yeah. So insurance rates are going up, costs rates are going up. But at the core, in terms of keeping people away from the venue, you can increase the perimeter. Yeah. But at some point, you got to let people in. And so for me, that comes down to how do we get to know these people in a way that we don't today? Because for your big Cavs Warriors game, for a, for a big Beyonce concert, they probably know less than 10% of the people who walk through the gate. Because tickets are pieces of paper. They get uh, transferred around, handed around to friends. They get resold in the secondary market at those big events. And so suddenly, you know, the, the, the craziness of a world in which they've sold all their product online, all of these people walk into their physical space, into their house, basically, and they only know nine, uh, you know, uh, one out of every 10 people walking through feels unsustainable. And so I think that's the kind of innovation that you will see in the business going forward. It's well, got to be on, driven on top, by those big artists. But. but on top of that, you have, all right, here's $300 for a ticket to sit here. Somebody buys that. They resell it for five hundred. That's it. That person buys it. They resell it for eight hundred. That's it. But then the person who sold it for three hundred initially, they don't get a cut of any of the subsequent stuff. So it seemed like at least sports teams and leagues would be the easiest way to do this first because they could all combine and control it in a certain way. But basically, they get a cut every time it gets resold. Isn't that part of where this is headed? I, I think so. And and I'll say that. Um, you know, one of the things that's probably standing in the way on the sports side is the season ticket. Mm. And, and that is because, you know, look, we live in a world in which content is being unbundled and music is being unbundled and people are able to get things on demand. And so now 50% of the buying in the secondary market happens in the last 48 hours. And so you can see it when you go on a place like SeatGeek. That's that's right. And so what ends up happening? You can happening, get tickets to a Dodger game three hours before the game and sit wherever you want. And, and so what ends up? Ha are we going to do the Meundies piece now? Or, or no? Let's do, okay, we'll do it. No. So so but but I agree. And 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 so but what happens with with the season ticket is that um, the person who buys that inventory is not the person who walks through the gate. And with the season ticket. With the season ticket. It would, I would say, I mean, it used to be in the old days, you would go to 70, 75% of the games. I think now people go to 10 of the 40 for NBA. So I was a Clipper season ticket holder last season. How many did you go to? We went to less than 20, which means I was selling more than 20 on the secondary market. I shared with Tolan, I probably went to six regular season games and then a bunch of the playoff games. And I lost thousands of dollars as a Clipper season ticket holder because there's so much inventory on the secondary market. But and, and then also people people wisened up and realized that they just wait. wait till the last day and jump on wherever and get, right. your, get your ticket. And so you sit back and you go, well, why would you be a season ticket holder? Why? Do, and, and the answer is, as a, as a fan, it probably doesn't make sense. So the question is, who is well, buying? Well, no, there all is a these... reason why. Well, there are two reasons why. Now there's one. The old reasons were, I'm locking down an awesome seat to these games. Otherwise, I have to go on the street and try to scalp That's tickets. Right. And now I know where my seat is. But then also playoffs. If this team gets good, That's right. I have a playoff seat. I don't have to pay 17 times as much to do whatever. So if you're a Warriors fan, I get it today. But or if you're a Lakers fan with LeBron coming in a year. And Paul George and Lonzo and but even Boogie there Cousins. you can buy the games that you want to go to. But not in the first ten rows would get tougher if the team was good. I think maybe the Clippers weren't bad, Be pricey. and I had trouble recovering my. People don't like the Clippers though. They don't like the team. Maybe look. I think there's a very the limited thing. list of teams though. Here's the thing. The reason the season ticket exists is not for the fan, especially in in, in those situations. You know, NFL only has eight home games. Oh yeah, explain this because I don't think people realize this. So, 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 which part? it's a down payment for the team that they get to basically take your money seven months before the season starts, and they get a giant chunk of it, and they just get to put it in a bank account. Well, well, well right. And and even more interesting now, I don't know if you saw this yesterday, but the Warriors came out and said in their new arena in San Francisco, they're going to charge a what is the equivalent of like a personal seat license so you're going to pay an upfront sum to them 
yeah. which gives you the right to buy season tickets for the next 30 years. And then what the wrinkle that they added was they said, and in 30 years, we will give you the money back for that personal seat license. So they basically are going to their fans and taking a 30 year interest free loan. Which they're putting toward the arena. Which they're going to put toward the arena. I'm not 100% against that. I, I, I'm not 100% against it either. They've put some real restrictions on how it can be transferred and so forth. So look, Rick Welts is one of the most forward-thinking uh, execs in sports. So I, I know that, and that organization obviously is great. So I know they're, 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 they're getting creative about that. But the dirty little secret in season tickets, for the most part, is that the majority of many sports team season ticket holders are brokers. And they do that for two reasons. One is they're afraid that by the end of the season, the team's going to suck and nobody's going to come and they're going to be sitting on loads of unsold seats. Or, or be mediocre. Now it's like either if you're mediocre or you suck, nobody wants to go unless you have some awesome young player. And so, even then they might want right. to go. So it's basically an insurance policy for the teams. And the brokers are partners with the teams in this. And the teams are willingly doing that to basically offload risk. Now you got to ask yourself, why do the teams need to do this? Like the, the range of outcomes of an NBA season exist within the 30 NBA teams. So the league itself should probably be able to build an insurance policy that, you know, the Warriors fund the the Pelicans or whatever, right? But so so that's the first reason that that those teams will will do that. The second and why the season ticket exists because it's really a vehicle for them to offload risk. But well, this, and then get the money early. Right. Get get that money early and and sit on it and make the float and know where they are. But the second is a vestige of the ticketing business and without getting too technical, like a team will sign an exclusive agreement with their ticketing partner where whenever they sell a ticket, they sell it through, uh, that's not a season ticket. They sell an individual game ticket through the ticketing company's website. So I had that with my LA Kings tickets. I can only sell them or I had to go through this really shitty website and try it. It was one of the reasons I gave up the tickets. I didn't like the website. It was really hard to get rid of them. But as you know, today, fans are coming directly to the secondary market. They're coming to SeatGeek. They're coming to NBA Tickets or Ticketmaster's secondary sites. They're coming to StubHub. But the teams aren't actually technically allowed to sell tickets there directly. But right. that's where fans are. So the hack that they do is they sell these season tickets to brokers who in turn turn around and sell them as individuals on the secondary market where fans exist. Yeah. And that's all because of these exclusivity provisions that don't really make any sense anymore. Um, and, and by the way, the last part to tie it back to the music piece is that season tickets don't have service fees. So what ends up happening as a music fan is you pay these exorbitant service fees that really subsidize sports fans yeah. in a venue. Right, because the ticketing companies got to make their money some way. So music fans are almost being assessed a tax today, so that sports fans can go without those fees. One other thing with season tickets, which I've written about a bunch of times, and I think you have too, it's just more fun to stay home now than it was twenty years ago. Mm. The TVs are better, um, especially if you're an NBA fan. You're you're thinking about like, all right, I'm going to go to a Clipper game. Yeah. I live in Santa Monica. Yeah. I have to leave my house. What am I going to do about dinner? I'll yeah. leave my house at five o'clock. I'll be in traffic for an hour. I go there. I'll try to get a quick dinner. I go to the game. The NBA games are always last past ten fifteen. I'm driving home. This is like a seven hour commitment versus I'll just stay home and watch 12 games at once on my 70 inch TV. The rest of our life is moving to on demand. Yeah. You get what you want when you want it, particularly in our entertainment options. That's why net, your Netflix stock is going crazy, right? Because you get it on demand. That's why your sponsor Spotify is so great because you get your music on demand. You also want to get your live events on demand and that's what the secondary market provides. Now, the teams know this and they're really working around the se using the season ticket more today as an insurance policy and like a financing vehicle than really something that's about the fan. Hold hold that thought. Speaking of insurance policies, our longtime buddies at Simply Safe, getting a good night's sleep easier said than done, especially when you think you heard a noise downstairs. What about that night with you? 
when the guy was in your garage. <laughs> yeah. You I had a guy in the run. I periscoped. I know. You I, periscoped I, it. You had a guy in your garage I, with helicopters above you. This guy, what was it, a hit and run? Two, two SWAT teams. He, he tried to shoot down a helicopter in the back alley. And, and he was <laughs> near periscoping it. <laughs> yeah. See, if you had Simply Safe, you wouldn't have been as scared as you were. Uh, when you install your Simply Safe home security system, you're arming your home with powerful sensors that actually tell you if a door opens or one of your windows breaks. A 105 decibel siren alerts you at the first sign of trouble. A dedicated team of security professionals watching over 24 7, ready to send the police, and with Simply Safe, no long term contracts, around the clock monitoring, only $14.99 a month. When Tate buys a house with, with Rocket Mortgage, yep. then you'll get Simply get Safe. Simply It'll be full circle. And Don't, I won't go to the post office. <laughs> and you won't go to the post office. Around the clock monitoring, only $14.99 a month. Don't spend another night second guessing your home's safety. Go to simplysafebs.com. Get a special 10% discount when you order today. That's Simply Safe with two eyes. Simplysafebs.com for 10% off your order. So we were talking about this new uh, Clippers arena that Bomber wants to build. Yeah. That um, I wrote about a little in my piece about how, why the Clippers should move to Seattle. And of course, they did all the opposite. They doubled down on Blake Griffin. They paid Gallinari. They're still going to move this thing. How many, how many arenas... Can one city have? I mean, there's there's almost not enough music acts to go around. I don't see any scenario where if he builds an NBA arena, artists are going to not play in the forum, which they love, and then play in this NBA. What else is in the arena other than the Clippers? Let I don't me, get it. Let me tell you what's great about it. Okay. He, I like you spun it around. He does not give a fuck. Because he's just super rich. Because this is a passion project for him. And he wants to make the experience great. I mean, he's doing fucking mascot trampoline dunks at halftime. Like so he does then he not should care. create the greatest so only for basketball arena that anyone's ever created. Full of technology, experience he cares about. Yeah. And and and, Get and USC do it. to play there. I, I think I think, you know, from a rational business perspective, hey, there's there, there's maybe there's ways to make it work. Uh, I, I don't put anything past past him and his team to figure it out. But What's cool about the prospect there is that he would build something that uh, isn't about stuffing as much money to his bottom line as possible, but about building the best experience for the team, for himself as a fan, and for the other fans who are with him. So I'm all in on it. With the NBA teams, I don't think the death of season tickets, if it's a death or whether it's a an alteration of how it used to work because the NBA, they make so much money from the streaming and all this stuff. Like the NBA's couldn't be in better shape. I think for the NHL, it's a real issue. I think the NHL was a very attendance heavy league and it still is, but you're asking these people to pay for 41 hockey games a year. And I was one of them for six years and regular season hockey for the most part blows. And you had the season tickets cause you want to keep them for the playoffs, but financially it's just smarter not to get the season tickets and then just to cherry pick the playoff tickets. But some of this is from a time when these owners weren't multi-billionaires and they needed the money. Like, I don't think it matters anymore. Your point is just, I mean, people either show up or they don't. Whether the vehicle that they do that through is the season ticket or not is kind of irrelevant. They needed the season ticket back in the day when these owners desperately needed the money. But now you've got, you know, Mr. Kroenke, uh, one of the wealthiest guys, you know, in the world who's building the stadium in Los Angeles. Like, yeah. He he is smart. You know he's gonna he he doesn't need the money, right? So so well, I think NFL season tickets. Yeah, that's not- it. Helps that these owners are you know the values of their franchises have increased five x in the last couple of years, so that it takes the pressure off the need to get all that money up front because what's a couple million dollars when you got a franchise that's worth a billion? Well, plus? hockey it matters still though. It does, but even there, the I would say baseball are- matters probably not as much because their TV deals oh, are so unbelievable. There's so much, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and hockey, I think, look, the, if you're a hockey owner and you own the venue, I mean, how many home, game, how many home games have you got, right? You, you still have 320-ish nights a year yeah. that you've got to fill up that arena, and that's what you're focused on if you're a hockey owner because that's, you that's where you're going to make your money. It's an issue. Uh, two football teams, the one in Carson. Are we going? Yes, Are we we're going, going to a Carson, a weird we're, Carson football we're game? We're totally going. Again, this is the same. This is like the Balmer Stadium because it's too small. There's not really a whole lot of suites. 
the fans are on top of each other. I've seen some soccer games there yeah. that were awesome. Yeah. And like, this could be the next thing. Like, who wants to sit up in the nosebleeds of an 80,000 seat stadium versus like the Nobody. energy of like a rock? It, it's, it's, all, it's like seeing this, you know, it's like seeing you two in a club. Like, I'm I've all in. I've never understood why more people didn't replicate the Fenway Park model. Because if you look at Fenway Park, I think there's like 36,000 seats yeah. and 10,000 of them are, are just flat out awful. Maybe more than that. Maybe 11,000. Just... Once you're past, once you're in a right field and you go around that corner in the deep, deep right field and right. the bleachers, like there's just so many bad seats in Fenway, but, but it's hard to get in. And yep. it's, it's almost like trying to get into the hot restaurant. And I've never understood why a football team didn't just build like the 45,000 seat NFL arena and just gear it toward like the lower seats and just get rid of the up, upper deck. They would say it's because, well, we want our fans to come, but... I don't think the fans care as much anymore. I don't think they would feel left out. I, I'm with you. We get two, maybe three years now, depending on depending on the timing of the stadium here in LA, of this experiment, which is what would football look like in a different scenario? In a 28,000. The Patriots stadium was like that before they built the new one. And it, and everyone likes the old one more. Even those metal benches, it was horrible. It was basically a round circle. Yeah. And it was the center of hell. Yeah. But it was there was great energy at those home games. And the energy is not the same, at, I don't think, at the new stadium. So, so I and think, you saw it at the Redskins stadium, too. I mean, th- that's right. And you and, had RFK, and, and then you went to that giant and, and it's mausoleum. My, my, my dad gave up the season tickets this year because he just cannot get out to the How many years? John Maryland. 40 years. Yeah. It's just too much. I'm fascinated by this soccer stadium they're building in downtown LA right next to Staples. I think that idea makes a lot of sense. What is it, like 25,000? Yeah, I think, yes, exactly. And just an awesome idea. Like there's train service down there. And now with the way the train has gone, you can get, even from the west side, you can come in. You can come in from the Hollywood Hills, wherever. Um, Any other part of LA, you can kind of get there. But also like it's... 15 to 20 to 25 minutes away from a lot of people in the hard LA Hollywood people at that low, low number of seats. I just think it's going to work. And I would love to see them also put a baseball minor league team there too. So so me too. Here's what we're going to find out that we're going to find out if we've reached peak saturation of stadiums, you ask could bomber build a stadium. Then you're going to have a football stadium on the West side of LA where the Rams and Dodgers play. You're going to have a big soccer stadium in Carson where the galaxy play. You're going to have bomber stadium on the West or the arena on the West side. You're going to have the the forum on the West side, the Rose bowl, the Coliseum, Dodger stadium, Hollywood bowl, the new soccer stadium. We're talking about, we almost got 10 places where a giant artist could play. But this is all part of what's happening with Los Angeles. This is why all the chefs are moving out here. This is the fastest growing city in America, which is crazy because it was already the second biggest city. But now all we need is for the Snapchat stock lockup to, to, to expire in like a month. And then you're going to have all these rich techies <laughs> fleeing to, to, to other true. parts of L.A. and starting their business. Yeah. It's going to be that happening. Yeah. Uh, it looks like about August 15th. You worked at Twitter for a long time. I did. What, two years? Three. Three. You're in charge of commerce and a whole bunch of other stuff. Media for a little while. My heart beats for Twitter. I love it. We just did uh, this Twitter show with them that I thought was really interesting. I... I like the way Twitter's thinking about stuff and you know, our show that we did, this, this game of Thrones post game show, this, I, I swear this isn't a promotional thing. It's I'm more interested in the science behind it. The, the ability to watch game of Thrones, go to Twitter where everybody's reacting to everything. Anyway, there's this post game show on demand. That's well done. Yep. This seems like the model going forward for, not just Twitter, but I think Facebook and a bunch of different mediums, this kind of on-demand, quickie, well-done, whatever, people reacting to stuff. And I'm starting to wonder, I, I, you and I would argue about Twitter. I was like, Twitter, they screwed up. They screwed up their lead. They blew it. They had all these chances to innovate, and they didn't. Now it actually feels like they're innovating. And meanwhile, whenever anything happens, people go to Twitter to yes. find out what happened. It feels like they're coming back a little bit here. I know you're biased, but what do you think? Well, I'm super biased. I, I don't know that Twitter ever went away, first of all. No, they never went away. Here's, here's the thing. I, I would, to, to know why I think t- Twitter has been what it can be for now, I would look at what is happening between Instagram and Snapchat, right? Where basically Facebook is the giant Death Star. And usually if you're a business in- <laughs> What does that make Amazon? Well, in, in the social space. Yeah. When they turn their death ray on you, 
it's really freaking hard to compete because they've just got that's what that's the definition of a network effect like it has power it is emote they can they've got better data than anybody so what you're seeing right now happen between instagram and snapchat is the power of facebook and the smart people at instagram are just copying 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 but guess what zuck tried to do that with twitter and Didn't it work. failed yeah so twitter still owns real time like for all of the of the you know what's been written about and the, and the sort of accusations that Twitter shot itself in the foot a lot, they Twitter did. still no, they owns real time. It has it, right, and and you have now the the uh, the president of the United States using it as a platform to basically communicate to the rest of the world. For me, <laughs> that's not a good thing. Well, look, he, here's the th- right. <laughs> for for me, what's what's interesting about Twitter is that. Um, and why they moved into this video strategy is that it turns out that you don't have to be a subscriber to Twitter to see what Donald Trump writes about on Twitter. You can see it on CNN. You can see it on any other place. That was the platform strategy that Twitter intentionally pursued and that helped it grow to hundreds of millions of people. But I think it probably was also the strategy that capped it because at some point there's people who don't have 9-11 PSD, like, uh, PTSD like, like you and I do and don't have to know what's happening right in this moment. They can go on their other sources of news and see stuff that's happening. Yeah. So the idea behind video was now we're going to put something that's exclusive and on Twitter where the conversation happens that, that then people want to come and be a part of um, so that's been, so that but that's been the challenge for them for 10 years, right? Is people are having conversations here. How do we keep them here and nudge them into other parts of our website, but yeah. we're keeping them on the website? The, how, how do I expand the energy around that conversation and take it into video? Because what was happening is the conversations were starting on Twitter yep. and then moving off Twitter. Yeah, I think Woj is a great example. The, the right. Adrian Woj Rask and ESPN, his Twitter feed which is not, he doesn't monetize. It's basically branding only for him and now for ESPN because they, they paid him. But he breaks the story there, but then that launches reactions all over the internet. Right. It just starts there, that's it. Right. So you look at something like that, it's like, well, how would that work if yeah. he's breaking that story, but then he's also keeping people there? And I don't know how you solve that. Yeah, I, I, my point was just that once you took the expectation away from Twitter that it needed to be Facebook... And then it could just be what it is, which is the place where the moment happens. Yeah. And and that's a focus that that you know Dick Costello, who's CEO, had, and Jack really refined as he's taken over and 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 done a, done a great job. You know, I think in thinking about okay, how do we make expand on that moment and make it not just about the the conversation, but also video that's happening live. And and so I'm glad you guys are doing it. And and I think the teams that have been behind building that product have done a really great job. I think it's good for Twitter that they shifted their thinking. It never made sense 2010, 11, 12, where they were just like, this is it. If it ain't, fo- if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know? And yeah. they were so afraid to tinker with it. Whereas you look at somebody like Facebook, and yeah, Facebook didn't make every lights out move, but they made a lot of really smart moves and they always seem to be pushing and trying and, and, trying to be a year ahead instead of a year behind. Yeah, you know? I mean, the, same the, thing with ESPN. ESPN was a was two, three, four, five years behind on stuff and now it's coming back to bite them. Well, f- Facebook made the big bets. You know, Instagram was going to do a deal with Twitter. Yeah. And, and Zuck locked him in the room and got the deal done with Instagram. Right. And then, you know, when Zuckerberg looked around and said, "Geez, messaging is taking off. I have got to be in messaging." He bought WhatsApp for, you know, at the time, you know, 19 plus billion dollars. And so he has been willing to take those massive bets to build sort of a constellation of apps around the big, strong network that is Facebook. Um, so and- the, the Star Wars 12 is going to be Zuckerberg versus Bezos for the future of mankind. <laughs> Bezos They'll have owned everything at that point. Bezos's guns are so huge right now that he will destroy Zuck in a in a, in a mano a mano fight. <laughs> Bezos is Zuck like, is going around eating barbecue in the Midwest right now, going to every state. Like he's just eating and eating. My guess is he's going to come back weighing four hundred pounds, and Bezos is just turning into this like superhuman. What happens when one of, of them locks, locks the NBA in a room in like two thousand twenty six, like a couple years before the rights are up? And just like, come here, we'll give you all our data. 
the, the same we'll, thing that's going to happen we'll to the NFL we'll sooner than that. For you. Yeah, the NFL's up in 2021, I think. I, I mean, th- these guys so they are, lock Adele in a room and they just say, here's all the things we can do for you. We'll sell stuff. We'll get, we'll have data on everybody who loves your league and we'll put you here and we'll go overseas. And yeah, we, what happens is that they're going to win that business. And if and, they want it, they might yeah, not want we're it. We're going to start thinking about these companies as, as very, very different from, from what they are today. And the only question there is, is are they getting too big? Does Twitter get bought? Everybody's been wondering about this for years and years and years. It's, I, I, I'm still too close to it. It's still too, uh, you know, close to my heart for me to, to, to speculate too far on that. But, um, but what I know is that Jack is the best steward for that business. He yeah. loves it. He, um, you know, he gave a ton of his stock back to the company to give it to employees when he took over as CEO, which was just a straight up act of love and caring for the company. And um, Jack will guide it to to the right uh, outcome, whether that's standalone or whether there's an opportunity to land the plane somewhere else. I'm, I'm quite sure of that. Do you feel like there's much more optimism with it, like internally with Twitter than there was like three years ago when people were like, fuck, what do we do? No, because people never said, fuck, what do we do? The uh, the amazing thing about working at Twitter is that you are at the center of something happening in the world every single week. Like yeah. every single week, it, whether it was what happened in Ferguson, whether it was, you know, the NBA finals, there is something that's happened. And then now in this moment, you know, in, in the Trump era, uh, I mean, that it's just electric to be the center, the platform that, that is driving conversation that shapes the world. And so that's always, it's, that's always been the mission for why people work at Twitter. Um, yeah, there are ups and downs. And, you know, a company like Uber right now is feeling what we did at Twitter, which is that the tech press is all around them. And by the way, for good reason, and they're getting, you know, uh, they're getting feces thrown at them left and right. And, and, and they're going to cocktail parties and people are going, Ooh, I'm sorry. What's going on? Oh, it must be so tough. Right. Yeah. But you know, Dick Costa, always would say this as CEO of Twitter. He'd say, you know, it's never as bad on the inside as it looks like from the outside. And it's never as good on the inside as it looks like from the outside. And so um, I, I, I think that the natural attrition that you saw at Twitter was because um, was because people in the, in the Valley work for two years and they move on. They're sort of mercenaries. I, 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 there is definitely a sort of rejuvenated energy there um, because of what's happening. But um, but but I think it it would be unfair to say that there hasn't always been that purpose mission driven um, reason to be at Twitter. I think it's a better product than it was. It's even just better to use, like being able to quote somebody's tweet and then have a hundred and forty character tweet on top of the tweet instead of the way the old way we used to do it, where you would have to edit the person's tweet that you were adding something to in front. Little things like that have been really good i think yeah, and, like their ability to play video better and all and, kinds of and stuff and that's been jack's approach since he took he took over his view was twitter is great it already is great and if we do things to make it incrementally better um and iteratively better um the sum of the parts is is, is going to make an impact trolls and, and abuse and all that stuff they've They've been cracking down on. They can still do better, but at least it's heading in a good direction. They're they're great people. They're working hard on that. It is, I think, the single biggest threat to the platform, and uh, and also and, the biggest threat to any potential buyer. I would say. I think that's the probably, ability to monitor I think, uh, abuse. I think that's probably right. Twitter is. Here's what Twitter is. Twitter is the cent- a centralized database. It, it's the largest database of real-time human conversation on Earth. It is the pulse of humanity. It, the Library of Congress literally documents and archives every tweet that gets sent. And uh, what comes with that is the most wonderful parts of humanity and some of the worst. Um, and the great thing about Twitter is that it gives every single user a voice. And occasionally the awful thing about Twitter is it gives every single user a voice. Like when we post this podcast and Big Balls 69, it's like, fuck Nathan, that guy sucks. <laughs> Thanks, Fart Sandwich. <laughs> fart Sandwich 3. <laughs> Couldn't get in. Couldn't get in early enough to get just Fart Sandwich. Uh, all right, we're done. Thanks. Yeah, I think we hit everything, right? We did. All right. Thanks to uh, Spotify. Did you know you can listen to the Bill Simmons podcast and every other podcast from the Ringer Podcast Network on Spotify, the streaming service you know and love for music, also fully loaded with podcasts. Find us in the podcast section within the Browse tab when you're using Spotify and mobile or just by searching 
for the Bill Simmons podcast. And while you're there, click to follow us to have our new episodes delivered right into your Spotify library. Head to spotify.com slash podcast for more. Sign up with stamps.com, the U.S. Postal Service, right at your fingertips. Any letter, any package, any class of mail, you're in control of all of it. They will even send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage and helps you decide the best class of mail. Use my code BS for this special offer. A four-week trial plus postage plus a digital scale without long-term commitments. Four-week trial, postage, a digital scale, no long-term commitments, never go to the post office again. Um, Don't forget to check out theringer.com. Only a couple weeks left with the old website. The new website's coming. And it looks nice. I'm very excited. Can't wait. I have a big website boner for our new website. Um, don't forget about uh, Talk the Thrones. Sunday night, right after Game of Thrones on HBO. On Twitter, go to at Ringer. Go to hashtag Talk the Thrones. You'll find us. And, uh, and since Tate's here, Tate did a new GM Street with Mike Lombardi. Yeah. That's on the Ringer NFL show. Congratulations, Tate. Tate uh, yeah, Tate, Tate's hosting multiple podcasts for us. Um, Thank you, Nathan. We got to get him a house, too. I know. We got him a house. <laughs> Rocket Mortgage is going to help him. Uh, thanks, Nathan. Good hang. This was fun. We didn't, we didn't talk about what our daughters, what, whether Instagram has defeated Snapchat with, uh, with 12 and 13 year old girls. That's next time. What's I, your 30 second answer? My, my 30 second answer is my daughter is getting massively hit on by boys on Instagram, and I just want it all to stop. Is it inst- but not Snapchat? Everywhere. Is she on Instagram more or Snapchat? both make it stop instagram at least i feel like we can monitor better but l- let me t- they, st- they start these stealth instagram accounts that we don't know about though that's a new thing that happens yes i'm following all this crap here's the truth you yeah. give your children access to this so they can make small mistakes that aren't bad now and learn the rules of the road and understand that every venue they walk into is going to have a camera and you have to do your best uh, and let them learn the language and then trust them to go speak the language in an intelligent way. How many times have you had the conversation with your daughter not to take a picture of a part of her body or a full body shot and mail it to a boy? She has learned that through mistakes of other people in the network. So she, she has seen her friends screw up, get in trouble in school, get in trouble with other parents, which is why we let her on early to, to, to again, see other people screw up, make a little tiny mistake here and there, so that when it really counts, they know what to do. I just bring it up all the time. We'll be at dinner. The waitress comes over. What do you have? I'll be like, I'll have the, I don't want my daughter to mail any pictures of her body to anybody else in her class. Burger. <laughs> that sounds like a surefire way for her to rebel. You don't want to. <laughs> that's, that sounds like a, that sounds like a mail in uh, subscription to daddy issues. Your, your daughter turns 13 in two weeks, two weeks. Mine turns. Mine is turning 12 and a half soon. We are both just screwed. Oh, well. Well, we talk about that another time. Thanks for listening to the BS Podcast. Enjoy the weekend. Bye.